Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today, I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with Dina Gashman, who is the author of the book, So Sorry for Your Loss, a memoir about her experience with the double losses of her mother and her sister over a two-year period of time. And it's a book that weaves in humor and research that she did on grief. And I think you'll really enjoy it. So um, we'll get into that in just a moment. Make sure you subscribe to this channel down below if you haven't already. And also subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen. Go to eoluniversity.com slash support if you're willing and able to make a small contribution that will help keep this channel and the podcast on the air. So we'll move on with my conversation with with Dina Gashman. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, Dina Gashman. Dina is a Pulitzer Center grantee and award-winning journalist and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, Texas Monthly, Vox, and more. Her second book, So Sorry for Your Loss, How I Learned to Live with Grief and Other Grave Concerns, has been featured on CBS, BBC, NPR, and in Time Magazine, Southern Living, Teen Vogue, and more, and we'll be talking about that book today. Dina lives in Texas with her husband and son, and you can learn more about her work at her website, dinagashmanwrites.com. So Dina, welcome and thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've been, I really enjoyed reading your book, and so I've been excited to talk to you about it. Um, First of all, I I love the cover of your book because it shows someone holding a casserole in their hands, kind of offering it out to another person. And I think that's, um, it's a great depiction of grief in a way and how other people respond to our grief. Yeah, it's kind of a universal symbol of, <laughs> of that, you know, early period of, of grief, I think. And, um, there's a chapter in the book that's specifically about food. And so um, the, the when we were, you know, thinking of what the cover was going to be, the publisher came up with that idea of like the hands holding out the casserole, which I thought was great because it is, I think it is one of those things. I think in most cultures, if not all, it's, you know, you see it and you're like, okay, I, I get what, what's going on there. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's a really comforting symbol in a way for grief. And to me, it just, it represents being connected to other people who care about you. And yeah. anyway, I, re I really liked that. I Thank mean, you. it just attracted my eye right away when I saw the cover, but I'm curious if you would just tell us what inspired you to write the book as a journalist. So this isn't necessarily your area, but yeah, I mean, I've been a writer for many years and I didn't, you know, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a grief counselor. So it's, it, you know, I wrote about lifestyle and entertainment and all kinds of things. Um, and I never wrote about grief until um, my mom died in um, 2018 um, of colon cancer. And then my sister Jackie died about two years later from alcoholism. And when my mom died, I really didn't write much about grief at all. Um, I didn't really write anything personal during the time she was sick, um, which isn't like me because I'm, I was writing personal essays all the time and things about being a mom and, you know, just a, lo a lot of humor kind of pieces. Um, but when my mom died, I just, I didn't know how to approach what I was feeling and what my family was going through. And then after my sister died um, in 2021, I had been given a lot of grief books and many of them were wonderful, but I just felt like there was a book that that I hadn't found that I wanted to read, which would be um, something that was, you know, personal and memoirish, but also had reporting and had humor and really kind of looked at different aspects of grief. And so it was a couple months after my sister died when I kind of thought, I think, I think I have a book in me about this topic. And I, th and I think I have some things to say because, you know, my family had this kind of double loss um, and, and I wanted to learn more about it. You know, as a journalist, like I, I didn't go into it thinking like, I will share my wisdom. You know, I went into it thinking like, I want to learn more and maybe along the way, you know, people will relate to the, to the story. So that's really what inspired it. It's particularly powerful that those two, as you said, a double loss coming so close close together that you really hadn't even had time to finish grieving over your mom's death when your sister Jackie died. And um, I can just imagine that's, it's pretty overwhelming, but I can see also why you may have felt compelled then, 
like now I really need to to start processing this by writing. And at least for me, I find writing is really helpful for me when I need to try to understand something that's happening. Yes, I totally agree. It definitely was helpful. And, you know, the process of researching and writing the book, and I interviewed a lot of experts and, and people who have deep loss in their life. And um, it was, it was hard, but it was also very helpful for me just in my own grief. I think that you know, facing it head on was helpful for me instead of kind of avoiding it or not talking about it. I just, I kind of just had this intuition that I, I needed to kind of dig into it to, to help me process it. And I think also, you know, for anybody who's had, you know, multiple losses, especially close together, like when my sister died, we had my dad and other sisters and I had this feeling of like, how are we going to do this again? Like we just did this. And once you know how hard it is and, and brutal it is, I just remember thinking like, I don't know how I'm going to do this again, like so soon. And so I think the process of writing the book maybe was my way of saying, okay, this is how I'm going to approach it. You know, my sisters had their ways, my dad had his way, but this was kind of what I did. And as you said, I think that feeling is so common of, I do not, I have no idea how I will get through this or how I can do it. And yet we do somehow we do get through it, but it's almost like moment by moment and day by day, we just keep figuring it out as we go. Yeah. And we, and we do make it through. It's, you know, when I hear, I have a friend who just lost her mom, I mean, maybe less than a week ago. And so everybody's grief is different, obviously, but like, you kind of know what it is once you've gone through it. And so I just feel for her so much. Cause I, I kind of know where she's at right now. And um, even if I hear somebody on the radio and they're, and it's so new and their voice is shaky and you just, once you've been through it, you just kind of understand what those, especially those kind of early days and months feel like. Um, and it's not easy, but we do, like you said, we, we make it through, we find our ways, we find what helps us and and we, we move through it. And you, you write in the book about, well, the title of the book is so sorry for your loss, which is one of those things that people may say because they have no idea what else to say. And it doesn't really have a lot of meaning to it. And I was just thinking about that sometimes when we've been through a loss experience and learned from it, as your subtitle says, learning to live with grief, it does feel like I know things that I could tell someone who's just starting the grief process, but I'm not sure that I should actually say those things. Like it'll get better. You'll feel better. You know, you'll feel better down the road because there are just some things that people can't hear when they're in that moment of acute grieving. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the reason I wanted to call the book. So sorry for your losses. It was, it, it was a phrase that it, it doesn't make me as angry now, but it used to make me so angry after my mom died and I would hear it and it just felt very, you know, it just felt emotionless and just like a cliche and I, and it angered me, but then I came to understand, like, you know, like you're saying, people don't know what to say. And so at least they're saying something. So, but I wanted to call the book that because it is such a common phrase that I think a lot of people, it, it's not that helpful. Um, and I think that it, it's still hard to know what to say, but once you have been through these experiences, like with my friend who's who's in it now, I basically said to her, like, you can call me if you want to cry or talk or punch a wall. And she was like, thank you for saying that. Like, you can say, you, you kind of feel a little more comfortable about what to say because you've experienced it in your own way. Um, so you're I, like, I never would have said that before. I never would have said like, if you want to punch a wall, you can call me like, but now I'm like, I that kind of feels appropriate to me. Um, so it just helps you speak that language. Yeah. Because you've understood this whole spectrum of emotions that you feel when you're grieving that, yeah, I think that that is one of the things we learn about grief by experiencing it. it. It's not what we may have imagined it would be like of, of pure, just only sadness. There's so many other emotions that arise in the midst yeah. of it. Yeah, it is. It's, it's just, a. I mean, to me, it was like a, a whole jumble of emotions, you know, from, from minute to minute, um, that you're feeling. And, and it's just, it's so hard to get a handle on it because you can't get a handle on it. Right. You just have to let it, let it wash over you when it comes, but yes, it's not, it's not one thing. It's not like you're sad 24 hours a day or you may be laughing one minute and then bawling the next. So it's just, it's a whole like hurricane of emotion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's such a, a roller coaster ride in, in a way. And then um, I found too, well, as you said, each of us has a different process with grief. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that might have been true in your family too, that it seems like your loved ones who are going through the grief with you, um, they're sharing the very same loss with you, but even they may be on a different trajectory, dealing with it in a different way. 
Yeah, I mean, we're all very close. And, um, you know, luckily there weren't any big rifts of, of like one of us didn't want to talk about it and want to, you know. So, you know, my dad thankfully went pretty much straight into grief counseling and and found a grief group. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, and it took me like eight months to go into therapy for it. And I finally was like, oh, I think I need, <laughs> I need some help here. And then my other two sisters had their ways of dealing it. So we, we each had our ways uh, and also ways of staying connected to my mom and sister, but they weren't, you know, wildly different, but yeah, we each had our own kind of path and my mind involved, you know, writing a book and thinking about grief 24, 24, seven. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, uh, and you talked about therapy in your book and the fact that not every therapist may be right for us as we're grieving. Cause you had a, an experience of initially a therapist not fitting well. Yeah. I mean, I went to one and it's not her fault. I mean, it, you know, just every, it's, it's, I mean, as many people know, finding a therapist is kind of, it's, it's like dating kind of, you have to find the right fit. And so this first therapist I went to, I mean, I was glad to have her because I really needed a place to go and just cry and get it all out. But she wanted me to do, um, a, a safe place, you know, where you kind of imagine a safe place and it helps with anxiety. And I understand that that is extremely helpful, but at that moment, it was a hundred percent, not what I needed. Like I couldn't, I couldn't focus on my safe place. I didn't want to be somewhere pretty. I wanted, it was, I was kind of in a place where I just, I wanted to be angry, you know, and I wanted to be mad. And, um, I think that can be healthy, you know, you shouldn't repress that, but so the safe place was not working for me. So I, um, found another therapist that was a little more like, let's just talk this out and, you know, get all that emotion out. And, and it was more helpful to me. Yeah, that really makes sense. And I think that's a good tip for anyone grieving who's listening is to, it's okay to move on from one therapist and find someone else because, and I think you'll know when it, when it feels right and it feels yeah. like the right fit and it's, it's not you. It's not that, like you said, there's not, there's something wrong with the therapist, just that yeah. it, their style may not match up with what you need. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even if, or just being honest with the therapist and saying, you know, this isn't working for me. Can we try something else? Like most of them are, would be more than happy to, you know, try something else. Um, and with my dad too, I think he tried two different grief groups until he found a group that he, you know, he, he's still in it. I mean, he, he just feels very comfortable and loves the, um, the counselor. And so, you know, you just have to find the fit. I just, yeah, I would hope people would not get discouraged. Um, if, if they, if seeking help is something that they feel they need, you know, don't get discouraged if like the first person doesn't work out because someone out there will help. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, one thing that I, I'm, I'm a retired hospice physician. Mm -hmm. And so I really, um, was I really interested in what you wrote about your mom being in hospice, because sometimes those of us who are working in hospice are not able to see the perspective of family members and even patients who are utilizing the services of hospice. And you wrote about that really well. I mean, the the feeling in some ways of being blindsided by not, not really understanding beforehand what hospice would, ought, would or would not do for you. Yeah, that was very important for me to write about that experience. Um, it's, I think it's the second chapter in the book. And I, and I actually, before I knew I wanted to write a book, I, w I wanted to write about hospice and I didn't know if that would be an essay or who I would write it for, but I just, I knew it was such a profound experience for us um, and so hard. And we felt so alone that I just, I really knew I wanted to write about that. And then when I decided on writing a book, I, I knew that was going to be an important chapter. And I think it's being discussed more now, hopefully, and because of the work that people like you have done, thankfully, um, it's, I think it's, it's more of a topic and there's a lot of like, um, end of life organizations and, and things like that and, and articles about hospice. But, you know, even just a couple of years ago, I mean, I had no clue what we were in for and I had had two grandparents, um, who died at home, you know, on hospice. I, but I remember visiting them. I remember a caretaker being there, um, but I was probably mistaken that the, I just assumed the caretaker was there 24 seven. So when my mom died, we brought, you know, we brought her home because we wanted to get her out of the hospital. And we, I just assumed that there would be 24 hour care, <laughs> which depending on your insurance is usually not always the case. And it's hard to get that kind of insurance. Um, so my dad learned and, um, so we were, yeah, we were totally blindsided. Like the first night of hospice, the orientation nurse basically said, you know, 
that will be administering the morphine and basically doing everything. And then that a nurse would come in, you know, once or twice a day, just for a little bit to check. So we were, I was completely shocked and unprepared. And it was a, it was a horrible eight days. I mean, and, and it wasn't the, the nurse's fault. I, I don't blame the nurses at all. I mean, they were doing their job, but I think it, like you said, like it is a job. And I think a lot of places are like, okay, you got to go to as many houses as you can and, you know, get, you know, and it just becomes less um, personal. Right. I mean, they did send a chaplain who was really sweet, but like it just, the whole experience was, we just felt totally on our own and, and it was really hard. And so I, it was important for me to talk about that. And, and I have gotten responses from people saying like, thank you for talking about this because I thought I was the only one. And, um, you know, just for people to maybe prepare for like what you might be up for, I think is important. Yeah. And especially because you only had hospice care for like that last eight days of your mom's life, which is the time when she needed absolutely the most care provided for her 24 seven. Whereas if anyone in the healthcare system had talked to you earlier and said, you know, you could meet a hospice staff now and get connected earlier on before she needed so much care, it might have eased you into it a little bit, at least to, with a little more training and a little more preparation. But you just got th kind of thrown into the deep end when having to do all this care that you'd never done before. And yeah, and I and I think that, you know, now come on the other side of it, like it was and I talk about this in the book, but it was very hard for us. To, I mean, we, when my mom was, she was on chemo and treatment for like three and a half years. So we knew about palliative care physicians. We knew that was an option for us, but it was just, I think it was almost as if to us, like if we, if we, you know, opened that door, then we would be saying, okay, mom's going to die. And we, we just weren't prepared to do that. And, and it would, you know, it was hard for us to even get her to do that because then it would be saying like, you're going to die. And so now I can, I think I could probably, you know, God forbid when my dad gets older, you know, probably say like, okay, we, we should do this. And it wouldn't be as scary. Right. And, and if you feed the earlier you do it, the probably the better, like you're saying, like, if you can actually kind of ease into it instead of just go home and <laughs> there you are, you know, with the morphine and, you know, hoping that you do, do it right. Which is really scary. Exactly. When you were describing like having a uh, you know, a list up where you and your sister were writing down the doses you gave every two hours and, you know, just the challenge of that and of being completely sleep deprived and exhausted and hoping you're doing it right and hoping you wrote it down or got the time right or the amount right. I that's mean, scary. that's it's so scary. Yeah. One of the things that some of us are advocating for is that we start with palliative care with mm -hmm everyone, <laughs> really. I mean, everyone who's facing any kind of a potentially serious life limiting illness so that everyone is already part of palliative care. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anyone is going to die right away from their illness, but the palliative care is to help them with symptom care and help them process about what they might want late, later on at a later time. Um, because it seems like that's a, it's a problem for every family. Like, how do we say suddenly we're going to switch our focus from yeah. doing everything to, to help you stay alive to now we're going to focus on helping you die. And that's kind of an impossible choice, really. It really is. It's a, it's an impossible choice. And I mean, we couldn't do it. I didn't, I didn't want to do it, but I did interview a palliative care physician. Um, I think it was in that chapter and she put it in a way that I wish I would have known. And, and I think could be helpful for anybody. As she said, what she says to people, if it's kind of early on, or if they're really nervous, whether it's the family member or the, the person who's sick, is she phrases it like, you know, um, we're going to open this box and we're going to look inside this box and then we're going to close the box and you don't have to think about it again. So it's, it's, it makes it so that it's this, we're going to, we're going to look real quick, but it doesn't mean it's happening now. And then we can kind of put it aside. And I feel like that's such a great, amazing way to kind of frame that conversation because it just makes it a little bit less scary. Yeah, I I love that because then the issue has at least been addressed and it's like the a little seed has been planted and it's it's in the back. It's not something you have to think about every day, but what, as the time draws closer when you may need to look in the box again, at least you don't feel so terrified by the box because you've already you've already looked at it. I I really love that. 
Yeah, I love it too. I think it's really helpful. And, um, you know, we just didn't know any of that. And so it was just, it was totally like trial by fire <laughs> kind of thing. So um, I do feel for anybody that goes, I mean, you know, going through that is horrible in any situation. Um, but I just think now I'm so glad it is being talked about more, um, whether it's, you know, end of life doulas or palliative care or whatever it is, I feel like it's, you know, we should be more open to talking about it because it's a scary thing, right? I mean, talking about death is scary. Nobody wants to do it, especially if it's somebody you love and adore, whether it's a person or a pet or, you know, um, it's really hard to discuss, but I think the more we get used to it and make it less scary, it'll just be very beneficial. Yeah, definitely. And I, I want to thank you because, because honestly, we need your perspective. Cause once again, those of us inside can't always see what the problems are. Like we know their problems. We see it from our point of view, but it's hearing a personal story about how challenging it was and how much your family suffered. And all of us would think, Oh my gosh, that isn't what we wanted to have happen at all. That isn't our vision of how it should be either. And it, it really brings it home to us change needs to happen and it helps us see where and hopefully how we might make things better in the future. Yeah. Well, good. I think, yeah. And like I said, I don't think anybody that's working in hospice, I feel like is probably, you know, that's a, cannot be an easy job. So, but I think it's, it's like any job when you do it over and over, you kind of, it becomes just your job. It's what you do and you go into the homes and, and so, yeah, maybe hearing, you know, the personal you know, thing would be helpful because we didn't, we didn't really communicate this to the hospice nurses. We were just kind of trying to survive. Um, so they would just come in and, you know, it's not like we were saying we need help, you know, we just would do, we were just kind of getting by. Sure. And, and I even remember that, like I took care of my mom in the last week of her life. And, and I remember like not sleeping every night, you know, most of the nights, um, everything was a blur and ran into okay. to all the moments ran together. I really couldn't, if someone asked me, what do you need right now? Or what do you need help with? I, I had no, I don't know. I know I need some, yeah. something, but no I have clue. no idea what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's very true. Yeah. That whole time, just like time was like, I talk about in the book. It's like, it was like a melting Salvador Dali clock. Like I just, I never knew what time it was. Like we were just in the house pretty much the whole time and people would try to come and visit and you're just, and I was like, have I showered? What am I wearing? Oh, I have pajamas on, you know, like you just have no clue. It's just moment by moment. Yeah. Well, I wondered if, say, if there's someone listening who has a loved one going into hospice, are there things that you would tell them that, that they need to know in advance that you didn't know when you were in that situation? I mean, I would say, I mean, it's very hard to like sleep, you know, and things like that, but, but I would ask for help. And cause you, my sisters and I did get caught in this mode of like, we got to do everything. We got to do everything. We have to take care of things. And like, I would say like, please don't feel guilty if you need to just go outside and take a walk or take a nap or, you know, ask somebody to help. We did that once with my brother-in-law. We were like, can you please, like, we have got to just step away for four hours. Can you do a dose of the morphine? And he did. So I would say, you know, ask for help. And if you feel yourself getting into that mode of like, I have to handle it, I've got to do it all, like take care of yourself because it really takes a massive toll um, on your mental health, physical health, everything. Yeah, and, and my concern is like what ideally what I, I would like to think of is that family members, you would get to be with your loved one and focusing on your relationship with your loved one and having conversations and not running around trying to take care of every single thing and exhausted so that it almost feels like you, you know, you may have had less of that time with your mom than you would have liked to have had. Yeah. Cause you want, I mean, we definitely had plenty of, I mean, we were all li basically living in my parents' house. Um, and so we had plenty of time where we would just sit next to her and hold her hand. And, and so we definitely got that, but yes, there was a lot of anxiety and stress in, in between those moments that were hard. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, we alluded to food when we talked about the cover of the book and I loved, um, there were a lot of, so many things I resonated with in your book, but you talked about a bucket of KFC <laughs> of fried chicken that someone brought over. Um, and I guess that was 
um, when you were grieving, but I actually, I had a similar experience. Someone dropped off a bucket of chicken when I was taking care of my mom. And I swear for days, that's the only thing I ever ate. I reached in yeah. and grabbed a piece of chicken and best, it was, best. it was yeah. so delicious and so com perfect comfort food. <laughs> so. Yeah, it really was. Like, I remember somebody brought us like a kale salad or, and my sister's and I, that is not, we, that's not what we need right now. Oh, it's healthy and it's a wonderful thought, but like we needed the bucket of KFC a hundred percent because it was just, you know, greasy and comforting and, you know, delicious. And so that was very helpful for us. And the, and the woman that it was a family friend that dropped it off, she just dropped it off without announcing it, which was very helpful too. Cause I think when you're in those moments, whether it's hospice or right after someone's died, like it's very hard to make decisions. Like, what should I bring? What do you want to eat? Like, I, I don't think I knew what I wanted to eat until it was right in front of my face. And so I think it's, it is helpful if you're going to do that to like, you know, you don't have to show up unannounced, but sometimes it's okay to show up unannounced and just be like, here's this and I'm going to leave and I don't need to stay because visitors can be kind of stressful too. Um, but yeah, the bucket of KFC and we got some gumbo and, you know, stuff like that was, was helpful more than the kale salad. Yeah. Yeah. The comfort foods, yeah. the things that you might not eat every day <laughs> in yeah. other, at other times in your life, but that just feel nourishing and sustaining with yeah. lots of carbs, <laughs> yeah. lots of fried, whatever is in KFC. I have no idea. <laughs> whatever is in there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you have some, a few recipes at the end of the book. I really appreciate that too. Yeah. I thought that was important because you know, the food part was you know, I mean, it's, it's such a common thing. I mean, my dad's freezer was like overflowing with lasagnas and all kinds of things, but I did put a couple of comforting recipes, like, um, my mom's chicken soup, you know, just things that are, that are kind of simple that, you know, actually, uh, and I did put the gumbo that somebody brought us, but I just, you know, I think they're just nice, easy, comforting things. And you don't have to make something like the KFC was meaningful, but once, when somebody did bring something homemade, it was, it just meant a lot because it meant that they spent some time actually working on that and putting some love into it. So it was, it was really sweet. Well, I used to always bring lasagna was like my go-to dish that I would make for someone until a friend of mine told me during a, a several month period when people brought her meals, she got 10 pans of lasagna and I realized right. oh my gosh like I gotta yeah. find something new to make for people yeah. something different that not everyone else will be thinking of yeah. that one's kind of a go-to I think my dad had a lot of those for sure yeah I mean we do appreciate everything but but it could get old after a while if <laughs> if that's all you have yeah yeah so I always I feel like food is a that's like a, a fail safe. You can't go wrong. If you bring someone food, make yeah. it with love in your heart. It will be something that connects you with that person and helps them get through those days better. Yeah. And uh, especially bring it in a dish that you don't need to have returned to you also. Exactly. Last thing you want to do is be like, Hey, can you, uh, can you give me back that Tupperware? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody's like in the throes of grief, but you know, it is, it's such a like universal, um, thing is to, you know, try and sustain somebody when they're going through something that's so depleting, you know, it's, it makes a lot of sense why you would do that because it's, it's easy to just kind of, you know, forget to eat or just, you know, not take care of yourself. So it's a very like seemingly simple gesture that is important. That's why it's endured, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, another thing you talk about, and we mentioned this before that your sister, Jackie, died a, a couple of years after your mom died and um she had an um alcohol addiction problem that she dealt with it sounded like for most of her adult life and so you wrote about ambiguous loss and i think um i think it's really important that we address that and even the fact that you probably grieved in many different ways even while Jackie was alive uh, Definitely. Yeah. So, you know, that was a big, a big part of wanting to write the book too, because you had asked earlier about what inspired it is that, you know, my sister suffered from alcoholism for years, probably, probably starting earlier than any of us knew. Um, and it was something, you know, having a relationship with a sibling for so many years who, you know, was a really bad alcoholic. I mean, you know, to the point where we could barely have a relationship, that kind of grief isn't something that I, knew much about. And so I was kind of 
flying blind for years and not understanding my feelings and the anxiety and the pain and the, you know everything that goes along with those relationships. Um, I just didn't see a lot about it. And so that was another thing that I wanted to express because having experienced it for so many years when I was um, working on the book, I found this woman, um, Pauline Boss, and she is a psychologist that she coined the term ambiguous loss. Um, and I think it was in the seventies that she did this. And so she had, she was talking to um, spouses of prisoners of war during Vietnam. And, and she come up with this term to, to explain like this grief that they were feeling when death was not the catalyst, right? It was the, the change in the relationship. So either the person was gone or maybe they came back and they were very different. Um, and she said that when, you know, to her words were like, when you put a name to something, it helps people understand their feelings a little bit. And so ambiguous loss is, you know, it's a, it's a kind of grief when it's death is not the catalyst. So it can be dementia. It can be, you know, substance abuse. Um, somebody goes missing, you know, just something where it's, I talked to one mom who's, she said her daughter was an alcoholic and she said, no one brings you casseroles, right. For this kind of loss. It's just, it's an ongoing thing. So it really helped me understand what, what we, I had been going through all those years with my sister. Um, and, you know, it took me many years to understand substance abuse and addiction also that it's not their fault and it is a disease. And um, so it was a very painful kind of thing to live with and go through, but, but working on the book a hundred percent helped me kind of understand what all of that was. Um, and talking about grief being a jumble of emotions, like when you love an addict or an alcoholic, it's, it's a so such a jumbled emotions like you hate them and you love them and you're sad and you're angry and you know it's just pick you pick your emotion and it's there um so I think it was important for me to to speak to people who have that and I think there's a lot of shame around it and people don't want to talk about it that much it's so true so I I wanted to express again I'm so happy that you wrote about that from your personal experience because it is something we need to talk about more and we need to make sure that we're supporting people who are experiencing it. And, and it, I think if it's, it was a much more open topic in our society, it might be easier for people to actually seek out support and help. Yeah, I think so. And I think, I think some of the stigma is hopefully going away. People are, under, people understand now that, you know, it is a disease just like cancer, you know, uh, but there's a lot of people that don't, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, why can't they just stop? And they're so selfish and, you know, um, and so hopefully the more we talk about it, more people will hopefully understand those relationships, especially for, you know, parents who I think, you know, my mom really struggled with it for years because when my sister first was, you know, we realized what was going on, I think she was very, you know, embarrassed and ashamed and um, didn't understand it and blamed herself. And so, you know, I just feel like, you know, the more we talk about that kind of grief, the better, because it's really, it's not easy to live with day to day. Yeah. And I'm sure you're right that parents in particular live with a lot, a lot of guilt, not understanding how did this happen and what, like, what, what did I do this and yeah. what did I do or could I have done? And, um, yeah, so it creates such a very complicated emotional situation. And then I'm sure that continued on after Jackie died as well. Um, trying to untangle, all, all of the various grief experiences you had had. Yeah. Cause um, yeah. Cause even just, you know, the fact of that, that being a cause of her dying and, you know, it's, it was a different kind of loss. Cause it was, although it was something we feared for years. I mean, there were, there were times when I definitely thought oh, we're going to get the call, you know, she's really doing bad, but when she died, she had been sober for a year. Um, so it was, it was a very surprising phone call because she had been doing so well. And so, as opposed to my mom who, you know, we kind of knew where this road was leading as horrible as it was with my sister. It was, it was a sudden kind of thing. So it was, a, it was a different, a little bit different process. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I just, I mean, even just thinking about those two losses back to back as they were, um, what, what a huge load that you and your family have been carrying for a few years. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, and for my dad, especially too, because he took care of my mom for all the years that she was sick. And, um, like when <laughs> she was like eating keto, cause he, he was like, you need to try eating keto. And so then he did it and he lost like 30 pounds. <laughs> so he went through a lot to see the poor guy. Um, but then, you know, he lost the love of his life and then a daughter. And so then we had the added thing of worrying about him 
Cause I, when my sister first died, he would say like, I don't know if I can get through this. And so that's, you know, that's scary too, but luckily he's amazing and, and is in therapy and is not retreating and he's out in the world, but, um, you know, yeah, just those two kind of things in one family is, you know, it's not easy. Like I still have moments when I real, I feel like, did this happen? Like, did this actually happen? It just doesn't feel real. And it's been several years now, you know, um, but there's, I definitely still have moments where I, where I have to check myself and say like, did, did that really happen? Yeah. It just, it's very strange. How has it been for you since the book came out? Because now you're talking about it a lot and reliving the experience and uh, how, how has that been? I mean, it's been, you know, since the book came out, I've had so many conversations, obviously about grief and loss, and it's been very meaningful because a lot of people have, whether it's at book events or sending emails or messages, um, people have shared their own stories. And, and the most meaningful thing to me is when people have said like, your book really helped me feel seen in my grief, you know, instead of feeling very isolated. And so that's been amazing. And, um, you know, I hope it's a book that people continue, like people have said, oh, I, I read it and then I got it for some friends and I hope it continues to be a source for people to, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not an expert just to feel less alone and maybe laugh a little bit. Cause there's some humor in there and understanding that humor and grief can go together. <laughs> they can, you know, it can be very helpful to allow yourself to experience all the emotions, right? Like, um, and so it's been really meaningful and it's, and I've, written more about grief since the book came out. So pro profiles of people who are grieving or um, actually have a big thing coming out in the New York Times um, at the end of this month. So when this airs, it'll been out, but it's a whole huge package about grief and creativity. And um, I feel like after that comes out, I may take a break <laughs> for a while, but I always say that. I always say I'm done writing about grief and then something pops up. And, and I think it's just something that is, you know, when it's in your life, it's, it's probably going to be something that I'm always curious about. And that I'm always drawn to because it, it's almost like, I'm always going to be a student of it now. Right. There's, you don't ever just learn it and you're like, okay, I get it now. It's, it's a continuous part of being human. And so, um, I feel like through writing, I'm able to kind of exp continue to explore what, what it is. I'm so grateful that you, you're able to use your platform as a journalist and a writer to talk about grief and, it, and, I don't know. It just seems to me like even a decade ago, we were not seeing as much in the media around grief or addressing it and talking about it. And that's been something I really wanted to see that change so that everyone out there in their day to day lives was encountering messages and stories about grief and loss. And it wouldn't feel they wouldn't feel so alone and would feel seen just just as you described. So um but it's really important that people like you who have the platform, like you're able to write for these major publications that, that you address it. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, I think I do think it's very important too. And I, and I do think it's changing. Um, I don't know if you feel the same, but it's, I, I have seen a shift even in the last couple of years, even since the book came, not because of the book, obviously, but like, you know, um, just a shift. I don't know if it's coming through the pandemic when we just, we had to face grief and loss. Like, how could you not? But I just, I feel like it's being talked about so much more and there's like apps and podcasts and Instagram accounts just devoted to poetry about grief. And, and so I, I feel like it's something that people are realizing like, yes, it's horrible and hard and scary, but the more we talk about it, the better we're, we're going to be. Um, and so I hope it's changing. Yeah. I, th I feel like that too. It seems to me like even in like, um, feature films and, in, you know, in, in all kinds of media that we're consuming, there's just a lot more depiction of people grieving and of loss and death in a much more honest and courageous way. I think <laughs> we're, you know, whereas as the past in the past, maybe it was a, a, a side mention that someone was grieving or, or grief happened, but now I feel like it's being addressed more directly. And I'm really happy to see that because it's so important and it will help everyone be healthier and be more open as they go through grief. I think so too. Yeah. And to, and to feel like you can, you know, say whatever you need to say or, um, you know, and I think on the, on the flip side, it'll help people that are scared to talk to people who are grieving. Cause I think if you don't have it in your life and, and I still have moments when I'm like, Oh God, what do I say? But it, I think it'll help the people who real feel really nervous about death and grief and like, Oh, there's somebody in my life. There's a coworker or a partner or, 
you know, I don't know what to say to them. What do I do? And they feel really nervous. Like hopefully it'll help people understand a little bit more that like, you can't say much that's wrong. I mean, there's certain things like, um, they're in a better place, you know, like probably not the greatest thing to say, but it, that it'll allow people to, on the other side, to, to comfort others in a way that doesn't freak them out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And even the idea of just showing up and not saying much of anything, you, you pointed out the woman who dropped off the chicken, I think just left the chicken and left and didn't need to engage in a big conversation. And I remember after my father died, well, a woman came over and she cleaned my house. She brought her vacuum cleaner. She didn't say one word to me. She just walked in the door with her vacuum and her rubber gloves and she cleaned my house and left, didn't say anything. And I appreciated it so much that she was willing to show up. She didn't need to ask me questions because I was just too tired to talk about it in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are the, the best gestures that people just, you know, like, the worst thing you can do is nothing, right? The worst thing. And I've talked to, I had this experience with somebody in my life and I talked to um, actually a, a parent who lost a child and they just said like, the absolute worst thing you can do is just ignore it in an attempt to not upset somebody because per, a grieving person's already upset, right? You're not going to like single-handedly make, you know, like, unless you say something awful. So it's just the worst thing to do and say nothing, right? You don't have to like send them to Tahiti, but like, you know, just do something like you said, like show up and clean their house or drop off something for them is, is so important. Yeah. And I, I know I always try to imagine like, why would someone not show up yeah. for a friend who's grieving? And then I thought, what if they themselves are grieving and it's triggering, except how, how perfect in a way to just come and say, I'm hurting too. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I mean, we show up who, wherever we are and with whatever we're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually met a woman on an airplane. Um, this was right around when the book came out and um, I was flying to New York for a book event and she said, you know, what's your book about? And I said, oh, it's about grief. And she goes, I will not be reading that. Like she was so adamant. Um, and I was not mad because I knew where she was going. And she said, you know, I have a lot of really hard grief in my life and I, and I don't look at it and I, put it in a box and I don't acknowledge it. And I just, that's how I, that's how I deal with it. And I was like, that's, you know, that's your thing. And then at the end of the flight, she apologized. And, um, but I, I think about her often. I wonder like, is she ever going to kind of peek under there and, and look at that? Cause it just seems even more painful to do it that way. I think, you know, just to kind of hold it so tight. Um, but I do, I wonder if she'll ever kind of look at it open the box. Open the box. <laughs> well, yeah. one of the reasons I put the book on the reading list for my online reading group is so that people can read about grief right now who maybe are not in the midst of it themselves and maybe not going through it. But the more we read other people's stories and learn about it, I mean, that book then can sit on their shelf and be there someday. If they are going through it, they might remember like, oh, I, I remember reading this and I, and go back to it and, and find comfort there. But I just think the more we, we learn about grief, even when we're not in the midst of it, Maybe it will be helpful though. Someone said you can never be prepared for what grief is. You just, you can't. No, definitely not. You can it's read take... all the books and poetry and watch movies and, but you know, yeah, you can never be prepared for, for what it feels like. And, you know, grief is a very physical thing. You know, it's very, um, that's one of the things that was surprising to me is just, you know, how my body felt and just, you know, the, the physicality of it is just, yeah, you'll never be prepared for it, but you can maybe feel less alone and less isolated, which I think is the hope. Yeah. Yeah. And at least, at least if we've taken away the terror of it, you know, the, the fear. So <clears throat> when each one of us goes through grief, we might be able to enter into that a little bit with a little bit more ease because we've heard about it and read, read stories and prepared yeah. a little bit for it. Yeah. Or, or at least, or felt like, oh, I'm going through this weird thing right now. Oh, but you know what? Other people go through this too. It's okay. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. Like, you know, if, if you're like watching a comedy movie and laughing, you know, two days after somebody dies, like, it doesn't mean you don't love them. Right. It just, I mean, I don't think I laughed two days, after. <laughs> but if you are like, it's okay. You know, you just to have those moments to be like, oh, you know what? This other person, you know, acted crazy too. And like, it, 
it's okay. Like it's, there's so much, there's so many things you're going to go through that you're probably not the first human to ever, you know, lose it in a grocery store because you're grieving. <laughs> exactly. And, and I love it that you, you did include humor in the book and you mentioned that kind of humor be actually being an important part of the grieving process that we need to make sure people don't feel ashamed or embarrassed that they, that they laugh at things and that they still find humor and even joy in the midst of all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's so important. I mean, my mom always raised us to always remember our sense of humor. So that's just something that has been a big part of my life. And, you know, she would always say like, always remember to laugh. And, you know, there's obviously you're not going to force yourself to laugh at a funeral. There's, you know, certain times, but it's just having, even during that hospice week, you know, my sisters and I would just have to laugh sometimes. Like we would just have to have those moments and we're like, something ridiculous happened or one of us said something we're, you know, we're like, we realized we're in the same pajamas for five days. And you just like, we had to have moments of humor to help us through. And, and that was okay. You know, whether it was like our cousin coming and being funny or, you know, it's, it's okay to have that. And it's very important to have that um, because it just, it's such a release of a different kind of emotion um, that I, I always find it helpful. Yeah. And it's helpful in your writing when you're writing about a very serious subject that you're also able to to weave moments mm -hmm. of humor into the writing and I haven't I haven't read anything else that you've written but I assume that that is your style that you incorporate humor it is most things I would say most things even the, the very first thing I wrote about grief was an essay about my mom um and about we used to watch Hollywood red carpets together and so after she died I that became kind of a ritual that I would you know kind of be stay close to her but that had a lot of humor in it, but it was very sad. You know, it was very hard. And I wrote about my dad starting to date again about two years after my mom and that had humor. So it definitely is something that it, it helps me a lot. It would have been really much harder to write the book if I couldn't have some levity in there. Um, so it, it definitely kind of follows through in most everything I do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's very helpful. It's a helpful coping mechanism, I think for all of us to, to be able to use the humor. Yeah. Well, um, I wanted to tell our listeners where they can get the book if they don't have it already. You can get it um, basically any bookstore. You can get it online. I mean, anywhere books are sold basically. And if they don't have it, you can just ask them to order it. Um, and there's an audio book also available. So if you just, you know, look it up online or go to, you know, go to your favorite indie bookstore, they should, if they don't have it in stock, they'll be able to get it for you. Yeah. I encourage that support your local bookstore, ask them to order it, and then maybe they'll order a few extra copies. But I think it's a great book for like a, a book club. Like a, if you belong to a book club, suggest the book, get, get your friends in the group to sit yeah. together and read it together and talk about it because amazingly once we start talking about grief we uncover that almost everyone has had grief in their life that sometimes they've never been able to tell anyone about and I think this book is a really it's a great book for a group to read together it's not overwhelming you know I, I mean I think it's a really good kind of introduction to open up conversations about grief well, thank you. And thank you for including it. That means a lot to me. Yeah. Yes. My, my pleasure. And, uh, it's been great to talk with you about it. Um, I'm going to check out your mom's chicken soup recipe since I'm looking for a replacement <laughs> for my lasagna. <laughs> Super easy and it's delicious. And then, well, chicken soup or the KFC again, I'm still going to keep that <laughs> the days. I don't feel like cooking. Your KFC. Yeah. Either one. <laughs> Well, well, thank you again. Thanks for the book that you've written. And then thanks for spending time with me today to talk about it. Of course. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dina about her book. So sorry for your loss. And I hope you'll pick up a copy of it just to have on your shelf. Uh, if you don't feel like reading it now, um, it's a great book to get you started thinking about grief and loss. Also a good book to give as a gift to someone else. So I'll be back next week with another conversation for you. And until then, take care. <laughs>